Hello and welcome to Global Sanctuary for Elephants podcast, Global Rumblings. Global Sanctuary for Elephants, or GOC for short, is a non-profit organization with a mission to create vast safe spaces for captive elephants where they are able to heal physically and emotionally, often from very traumatic pasts. I'm your host, Nadia Mari, and I'll be taking you to the lush jungle of the Mato Grosso region in central Brazil, home of GSE's initial project, Elephant Sanctuary Brazil. Currently home to six female Asian elephants, lovingly referred to as the girls. Hello, welcome, and thank you for tuning into this week's episode of Global Rumblings. I am again joined by Kat and Scott Blaze, co-founders of Global Sanctuary for Elephants, and we will be talking more about Gida and Maya, the sanctuary's first two elephants. So let's head on over to Brazil. Hi, Scott. Hi, Kat. Hey, Nadja. Hey, Nadja. How are you? I'm fine. It's, it's summer here, so temperatures are high, long, humid, and uh, hot days. So yeah, it's, it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> you make that sound wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're just coming out of your, your the, the rainy season, aren't you? So, uh, yeah, we are well into dry, dry, dry now. Um, and it's weird, the oddly hazy today. Uh, it's very, very weird to have this kind of haze, especially with, with being so dry. Uh, it's normally like uh, sort of towards the end of the dry season when you have fires and that haze from the smoke, but it's different. It's like this. It's strange today. It's lovely, nice temperatures, but it's just a little bit different. Okay. End of the world. <laughs> no, not the end of the world. <laughs> so before we talk more about Gida and Maya, I'd just like to take the opportunity to give a big shout out and thank you to all our listeners for all their lovely reviews and ratings of the podcast and also their comments. And I'd like to uh, read out two comments from the Facebook support group, Friends of Global Sanctuary for Elephants which I, uh, I had to laugh about. So the first one is from Kaylee, who wrote, I have just finished listening to the latest podcast. I am exhausted, in capital <laughs> letters, <laughs> and in total awe of how Kat and Scott pulled it all together. So yes, Kaylee, I agree. We were all, I think, very exhausted after episode 11, after we heard about how Kat and Scott and their small but mighty volunteer team managed to pull everything together to rescue Gida and Maya in just 10 months because the alternative would have meant the two going off as an attraction to uh, an aquarium in Sao Paulo, which doesn't really bear thinking about. And the second comment I had to really laugh, it's from Maggie, who says, um, I'm really enjoying the podcast. Thank you so much. Our pleasure, Maggie. And it's quite a long comment and she talks about how... Um, surprised she was how many hurdles you went through to find the sanctuary property and then she says i actually believe cat can talk just as much as scott <laughs> <laughs> only if you make me <laughs> if you don't ask me i can just sit quietly off to the side i like i like silence <laughs> we, can, we can manage that yeah i can put tape over my mouth <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> I think many people are very surprised because they only see Scott on the camera. Um, but OG, that's that's only because Kat is actually very camera shy, isn't it? So you've got a lot to say, which is wonderful. And I think people are really enjoying actually hearing more from you as well. But it's just that you don't like to have your face on camera, which is fine. Uh, for Pocha and Gijamino's rescue, since it was so long, the arrival and how long it took them to get out of their crates, we actually split. He did Facebook Live for a bunch and I did Instagram Live for a bunch. So I had to talk for hours and hours <laughs> and hours. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just, I'm supposed to stay quiet today. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, 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 I don't think Maggie meant that. No, I think the reality is that none of us really like talking on <laughs> the videos or cameras. Yeah. Uh, it's not really anything that's natural to either of us, uh, but it is, I think, because I've had to do it for longer, there's a little bit more comfort in it, but it's definitely not yeah. something either of us enjoy of being in front of the cameras whenever we have to do 
you know, uh, pre-recorded interviews, you know, for a news crew that can't come out here or a documentary crew that can't come out here for some reason, those are really painful. Um, it's just not our nature. You know, we'd rather be picking up elephant poop. Yeah, you know, <laughs> absolutely. You know, I was working on a water tower with somebody yesterday and, you know, that's, that's what we do. You know, that's really who we are, uh, being in front of the camera, being in front of the, the audiences is not where either of us want to be. So I'd just like to take the opportunity also just to, to briefly introduce the support group, Friends of Global Sanctuary for Elephants, on Facebook. Um, I'm a bit biased. I've been admin there since 2019 when I came back from volunteering with you guys. And I reached out to Terry, who is one of the admins. We are a group of five admins, but not only women, we actually have a man in our group as well, the wonderful Mark from England. So that's great. But he's very comfortable with us, with us ladies. So that's fine. And Terry, one of the members who's actually been there, I think from nearly right from the word go, said that the group initially started as the Molasses Girls, five members, five women, who used to buy jars of molasses for Gida and Maya from your wish list. As it transpired, the support for your work was met with so much enthusiasm that they actually decided to do their auction to help you expand the female Asian habitat. And so they then didn't call themselves the Molasses Group, but then they formed the group Friends of Global Sanctuary for Elephant and pulled off this amazing auction that actually raised $40,000. Quite incredible. I didn't, I didn't know that. So yes, the group has been going since. It was founded in January 17. So that's seven years now or you know, six years. Yes, yeah, so if that's something that our listeners would like to join and say so that sounds like fun, we, we are an independent uh, support group of GSC. We have about 5,000 members and we do our own little things. We have Fun Fact Friday, we have crossword puzzles, and we also have our small fundraisers like Trunk or Treats, which I think this year will be in its fourth year. It's a fundraiser for, um, for Halloween. And also two members at least two members I know of, recently donated to your auction, Trunks and Treasures, that is Gudrun. She um, auctioned off her third fiber art piece of work um, of Mara and Cynthia, who um, donated a quilt. So, yes, it's it's a great group and uh, it's a fun place to be, a great atmosphere. So if that sounds like something that you'd like to join, just hack into your computer now or into your mobile, Friends of Global Sanctuary for Elephants, but we'll put the links into the show notes as well for that. We get a lot of praise for what we do, you know, and the reality is we've said it many times, we can't do this by ourselves. You know, we have skills when it comes to elephants, but in order to create, you know, the sanctuary, it needed a lot of support from a lot of individuals. And it's always tough in the beginning because it is just kind of a pipe dream type thing. You know, we have more than that, but you know, when you're trying to essentially sell the idea to somebody, it's not always super appealing. You know, people love rescuing elephants and, you know, once you're established and you have elephants, things get easier, but in the beginning it's really difficult. So to have a group of people that were willing to step up and, the first auction was a lot of work <laughs> and put in that amount of work to help uh, expand the facilities early on when we didn't have a lot of support was fantastic. Yeah, and it's a group that a key group is somebody that we know we can always go back to. You know, they're always willing to jump in at any moment, whatever the need is. And uh, something that brings us a lot of peace of mind, uh, knowing that we have that, that, that key group, but also all the supporters that donate. You know, when we are just talking to a potential donor, last week and she wanted to understand the demographic of our supporters. So I gave her a little, you know, a little piece of the puzzle of, of, of picture of the puzzle, what it looks like. And it's amazing when you step back and look to see what a very, a relatively small group of supporters overall, but just how mighty they are and how willing they are to do anything at any time for these elephants or elephants in needs. And it's something that is, is fundamental for our organization and fundamental to be able to give elephants, you know, a new life. Yeah. So, um, yes, from, from jars of molasses for Gida and Maya to, uh, I think, uh, Terry, that's one of the admins said four truckloads of steel for the expansion of the female Asian habitat. We'll go back to uh, Molasses and back to Gida and Maya, who were your first 
two elephants, two um, former circus elephants. And we left off the last episode. You talked about how their friendship, how their relationship grew as you continue to expand their habitat. Can you explain what you meant by that? Is it just because they had more space? So they were able to take time away from each other or... (laughs) <laughs> you're the one who said it don't look at me <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I have to remove the tape off my mouth and let cat talk uh, um so it's all internet connected um you know we know that everything does tie into one another and and you know it is not just one element that makes sanctuary what it is uh yes the space and what they have to explore is one element of it and but also the time that they are here and the level of respect that they feel, uh, the respect that they feel from the team that is here, that they start to have a sense that this is their life. They start to have control over their space, over what they want to do. Uh, And with that, that just allows more doors to open for them to explore other elements of who they are. And some of those elements are friendship and that social element of who an elephant is. And we know that it was very dysfunctional for so many years with these two because they didn't have that comfort. They didn't have the space. They didn't have the protection uh, that they needed to be able to explore that side of elephant life. Uh, So it is, you know, all these things interconnected. Yes, as the space evolved and grew, so did the relationship. And but that would have happened whether they started with a large amount of space, you know, and it was just through a function of time. Or was it a function of, or and as well as a function of time and the space evolving at the same time? I'm trying to get Kat to talk again. <laughs> now she's holding up. <laughs> nope. Maggie, what have you done? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think when people think about space and elephants, they think about the physical aspect of it. But space is so emotionally healing as well. It is. I don't know if we've talked about it yet. Elephants' minds shut down so much in captivity because everything's the same. It's people come in at the same time. They get let out of the barn at the same time. They eat at the same time. They have training at the same time. You know, it is just this. I could only take 10 steps this way, 30 steps this way. Their life is generally so sterile that, you know, decision making and that part of the brain kind of just stops functioning. Um, And we've seen it when elephants have come to sanctuary that it's difficult sometimes. I think we talked about Delory not knowing she could walk past a pile of logs because it wasn't the end of her exhibit. So, yeah. So I think what you see, you know, with elephants psychologically with space is them reconnecting to many different parts of their brain that haven't been used. And then you have the just new sights, new sounds, new smells, how stimulating that is, you know, choices to make. Do I want to go down to the creek today? You know, what's over here? It just, it brings everything back to life in such a way that I think that's always super beneficial to their emotional well-being in general. And that helps facilitate with relationships, whether it's with caregivers, with other elephants, just because they start to become much more whole in general when they have that space. A relationship with themselves. For sure. You know, understanding. I know it's a huge element of understanding who they are as an individual. And you know, we all have to do that. We have to understand who, are, who we are as an individual before we can understand who we are as a partner or a friend or a sibling, you know, or whatever that is. We have to understand ourselves and they just never had an opportunity to explore any of their wants or desires. And I, know, I think most people don't realize how impactful choice is. Um, And you're talking about beings that have essentially not been allowed or been in facilities that allow for choices to be made. I mean, all of the choices are made for them. And I think when people started to kind of grasp a little bit, the concept of losing that sort of freedom was with COVID and lockdown and people saying they were stuck in their houses and they couldn't go out and they couldn't do this, that. And that's just a tiny fraction of the autonomy that humans have. And I think people started to realize the impact that even tiny choices have on you as a being. Um, so I think 
again, the space and being able to make even what seems like the most minuscule of choice is huge. And it's almost impossible to know who you are if you don't have the ability to make choices. I mean, the choices we make in life define essentially, at least partially, who we are. And these elephants haven't been able to make choices. So they don't know, you know, would I be nice in this moment? Would I be naughty? You know, the whole gamut. So there's so much that goes into what space actually brings them. And when that COVID comparison, when so many people talked about, you know, in, when lockdown, in the first couple of months of lockdown, we're talking about the first couple of months. We're not talking about the first couple of decades, you know, and then for, further that, looking at my Gita, it wasn't locked down in a small space. It was chained to the floor. You know, they were for six years before coming here, they were on a three meter chain. For how many years prior to that, they were on maybe a four meter chain, you know, sure. or shorter chain, but they never had that space. They never had any sort of opportunity to explore, you know, life at all. And, you know, we talked about poaching Um, I'm not sure if we're talking about it here, but in some of our posts, we talked about, you know, 400 meter square meters of a concrete hole, you know, and everybody has this visual perspective of what that is. And it's like, oh my God, can you imagine but then, you know, let's go back to Mayan Gita again, three meter chain, you know, it's a completely different scenario. And so for them to have that space and the freedom and time and autonomy to explore and explore at night and, you know, and we talked about this, at, you know, in some of the previous episodes of exploration at night, but you could see when we were coming in the morning, not only were they exhausted, <laughs> uh, but there was just a, a different level of peace that that is there in the first first hours of the morning there's just this calm that that comes out of the night that is just really very it's just very calm it's peaceful it's tranquil it's you know that space that is they're resonating that is their space their life for the first time and it's hard to put that it's really hard to to it's really hard for us to fathom as humans you know, I know some humans have definitely had horrific scenarios that that could compare, but for the most of us, you know, none of us have even come close to touching that level of restriction, deprivation, yeah. deprivation, exactly. Yeah. And I think freedom and choice is something that we take, at least in in our part of the world, or you know, I live in Germany. Freedom and choice is something we just take for granted. And as you said, during COVID, we had an inkling of, of what it actually uh, actually means. But even then, you know. If, some more and some less. I'm, I'm very lucky. I live sort of by the woods. So I'm like three minutes out the door. I'm in the woods in the middle of nowhere, but other people, you know, stuck in their apartment for, for months and weeks, depending on which country you're in. You, you shared some really endearing stories in that last episode, the, the three step and rumble from, uh, <laughs> you know, when you, when you expanded the yards, I actually did some research. Um, I, I had to get my brain working about metric and acres. So I found out that an American football field, including um, the surrounding areas, is roughly 1.23 acres. And, uh, and, and the European football slash soccer field is about 0.6 to 0.8 of an acre. So, yeah, so that might be put, put, put the size of, your, of the, the first two yards or the first yards more perspective if people can think about uh, American football or um, European soccer fields. So yes, you, you, that was the uh, the two step or three step rumble, and then also Gida trying to uh, wanting to protect Maya from Wally, her drone. <laughs> and uh, also when Gida was uh, it was a little bit later was sick with colic, and Maya said, "No, no, no, I have to stay with you." So yes, to share maybe some more stories of how how the two how their friendship blossomed, or how you noticed that they were beginning to understand who they were. Now you're just going to look at me every time she asks a question. Yes. <laughs> I know. That is not how this is going to go. There have been too many comments about Scott talking too much, so I'm done. <laughs> it's going to be a very quiet podcast if you stop talking. No, I'm actually just momentarily pausing because of my guilt for talking too much. No, there's so no. many different little moments and just trying to isolate what those were because they all kind of blur, blur together into this jumble of experiences. And I don't remember anything at the top of my head that was any other 
key profound moments, and I don't remember if we talked about it in the previous episode, you know, uh, now you can remind me if I did, is about the radiance that we saw with them. There's just this, the change that we saw, I think we did in the in this bigger space. Yeah. And that was one of the most profound moments for me with all that we saw with them, even with Gita standing over, or, um, protecting Maya, you know, and, and the, as the first time we took Wally up, I mean, those were beautiful moments, but for me, nothing was, and, and nothing sticks as, as profoundly as that moment when you just saw that new radiance that came out of them. That was just such a powerful experience to see that after all they've been through, after all that they've grown through and to see that change was, I don't know, it's just astounding still for all the times that we've experienced sanctuary life and sanctuary recovery. You still have those moments that just kind of smack you in the face and say, yeah, this is, this is what really matters. I think a lot of times with the relationships, it's not, I think it's similar to human relationships. A lot of times it's not the big things that are most impactful. It's those lots of little moments that emotionally are so much more substantial, you know, the little supportive moments, the, the little looks, all of that sort of stuff that happen between humans. I mean, I think a lot of that is similar with elephant relationships in when they do get to that point and they have that depth to it. It's, you know, there aren't these big things. It's a lot of the, you know, their every morning rumble parties that they had when it was time to eat and say good morning and how happy they were with each other. I mean, we talk about this, you know, with other elephants as well. Sometimes they'll separate for like 30 seconds or two (laughs) minutes (laughs) or, you know, a half hour and they come together and they have to have a party. It's like they haven't seen each other in, you know, five years. It's like, oh my God. And it's so charming and it's really endearing. And they would do this every morning pretty much when we would go down to the barn to feed breakfast. It would be this whole you know, side by side, each with their trunk on the other one, holding their face, trunk in the mouth, touching their ear. I mean, they were just so charming with each other. And one of the nice things for me about them was that they were really, really close and really, really loving, but they were also secure enough to not have to be side by side all the time. You know, Maya would go off and go into an area she wanted to, Gita would go explore the woods you know, they'd be apart for a couple of hours and then they'd come back together. And it wasn't like they needed each other. You know, it was more that they wanted to be together. And it was really sweet. For me, thinking, you know, with that, as Kat was talking, I was thinking about them coming out of the woods in the morning. You know, they <laughs> come in out of the woods and they just had this bigger than life grin, you know, as they both come out of the new forest that they've been exploring for the first time. And it makes you wonder what's going through their head as they explore those, you know, there's no way for that, no way for us to answer that. Um, you know, they made a slide at one point to go down <laughs> into the Creek. It was actually, it's a really steep Creek bed. It's probably seven or eight meters high. Um, and not a vertical drop, but a near vertical drop. And they actually made a little slide to get down in there where they used an old cow trail. And uh, it was quite vertical. I mean, you couldn't, and they went up and down it and you could see their ankle marks where they would actually make little steps to climb up. And then when they'd go back down, they would put their front feet in front and their back feet kind of slid up behind them, you know, laid backwards. And they would just literally slide down. And these are two elephants that have been, you know, in circus. They haven't had to manipulate this type of terrain. And knowing the two free spirits that they are very different free spirit individuals, but very exploratory free spirit elephants. You know, I wonder what that was like for them. And, you know, did they get down to the bottom? It's like, wow, that was so cool. Let's do it again. You know, what, what's going through their head, but even just that opportunity to explore life and seeing them explore that, that life together after all they had been to I mean, it's just those beautiful moments that, you know, we, Similar to COVID, COVID, we talk about having a glimpse of what captivity is like in these experiences. It's just a glimpse of what the recovery is like for them. You know, we're only seeing little bits and pieces because we're not with them 24 hours a day. Sure. You know, so we're only seeing these little bits and pieces, but you can kind of imagine how, again, how profound and impactful it is and how meaningful it is for each of them. 
And the creek bed has multiple places that are very easy to cross. <laughs> yes. You know, it's not it's like that. they are crossing there because that's the only place to cross. I mean, we could take the four wheeler and the dump wagon across to pick up poop. So clearly it's easy to cross in certain places, but nope, that's not where they wanted to cross. They wanted to make their own. Apparently they wanted to make their own slide and do it their way, which is great. We still bring folks out into the habitat when elephants aren't there. Uh, folks that have worked with elephants in captivity and we show them the slide and they're still amazed that they go up and down that. Yeah, these girls do everything. So would it be right to say then that this physical healing also then improves their psychological healing because they felt more confident? Did physical healing give them more confidence? Yeah, I think it's definitely all tied into each other. I mean, especially, I think more so probably with Gita than Maya, just because Gita did arrive so thin and, you know, she just wasn't in great shape. And the more she built muscle and the stronger she got, you could tell emotionally that she felt stronger as well. She was so determined. I mean, in that video, I think, again, is one of the clips is when she climbs up out of the creek crossing and it's literally a fork in the road and the one fork we drive the four wheeler down and the other fork like comes up to a wall a, a meter, of dirt a, a, meter, a meter and a half vertical drop <laughs> and she decided that's where she wanted to climb out of and again she's up on her ankles and climbing out and you know it was just you could tell she just felt really good about herself you know, there was just so much about her presence that was just so strong. And again, I think, yeah, her feeling better physically definitely led to that. I just got quiet because I went to, I went to Gita's passing. Um, of course you did. And now I'm going to cry. <laughs> You know, it is, it's such a gift. You know, we talk about all these gifts and this, this, the absolute joy that you could see in them of celebrating this life together and growing together and finding this life together. Um, it was just an absolute gift for them. And, you know, the reality of sanctuary is it can't last forever for any of them. You always want it to be longer. Sure. Um, Unfortunately, most of them show up and, they're already very geriatric. Um, this population is actually older than the population we had in the States. Um, and they come with lots of physical issues, especially here because none of these elephants receive any sort of medical care. So they're kind of a mess and, you know, we know that that's what we sign up for, but they don't. Like it, it, still was a, it still was a shock. Uh, it's coming up now, isn't it? To her at the anniversary of her. Well, when this podcast is out, it would have already being, I think it's the 25th of June. I, I you're remember be, you're I better than the, we are on that. <laughs> I don't remember those dates. <laughs> those are the dates <laughs> I, I actually she, don't yeah. try to remember. Yeah. Well, we always do, as a, when we talked about Friends of Global Sanctuary for Elephants, we do do um, a memorial post every year. So we are preparing for that now. So that's why I know the date. I remember I was in bed. I was, I was nearly asleep and my husband came in. And he said, are you awake? And I sort of said, well, it depends. I'm very tired. And he said, I said, what's wrong? And he had this, he said, one of the elephants have died. I said, what? You know, what? And then, yeah, and then the next morning I sort of read your post and was shocked. But then everyone was so shocked. Just under three years of her being with you. and We were shocked too. That's because Gita was supposed to live forever. Yeah. And I told her I was mad at her, which I say jokingly, but she Lovingly. was... Yes, of course. Um, she was, she's my girl. Um, but she was so strong in so many ways. And it was, yeah, it was just very surprising for all of us, unfortunately. But it's the reality of life, that. though, isn't it? Yeah, I wish we could fix that. Yeah. And that's the thing with, with sanctuary, it is. The highest of highs and lowest of lows sometimes, you know, you, you feel the exuberance, the elation is, it's amazing. It's, it's, it's un incom uh, incomparable to anything that we've experienced, but then you have those smack in the face reality moments that comes back to, you know, we're all so vulnerable. 
You know, and the reality is at any point, any one of these elephants could die tomorrow. I don't have anything to knock on, but, um, with the ages they are with some of the physical, physical compromise, some of them have, I mean, it wouldn't be surprising if, you know, when we went to take care of them tomorrow morning, it had happened, but still it would be, it's so hard. Um, we know it's the reality. I mean, it's certainly not the first time it's happened. Um, again, we know that that's what we signed up for, but there's still that childish part of you that thinks they can just keep going and, you know, you'll be the elephant that lives to be, you know, 85 in South America, which of course is completely unrealistic. But I mean, I joke, Hannah's never allowed to die. She's so good for all of the elephants in the herd and the new members. And she just has this way about her with all of them. And, you know, it's hard to imagine any, another elephant coming and her not being there, but she's our oldest elephant. I mean, she is old. <laughs> been through a lot. <laughs> yeah. And she's definitely been through a lot and she's had a lot physically wrong with her, you know, before coming here that some of it still lingers a little bit here and there, but yeah, it's the hard part of sanctuary, unfortunately. They don't live forever. When Gida passed, you had already a third elephant. Yeah, we already had Hannah. Yeah. So maybe in our, so we don't end the uh, the podcast on, on such a sad note, but it, yes, it, it is a reality, as you say, you know, you're, you're the elephants you have, they are geriatric. They have had decades of no treatment and... As unfortunately, like when, when Pocha came, huh? she was only there for a couple of months and uh, yeah, her, her past caught up on her. But Tana was there. So maybe in the next episode, we can talk about how Tana helped Maya or Maya went off on her own. Maybe then discuss how, how Maya then obviously had to. Well, e- e- even before that, how Hana. <laughs> Anna tried really hard to love her sisters, <laughs> overwhelmingly so. Uh, yeah. So I skipped a little ahead in that. But sometimes that happens in those, you know, with this going down memory lane, it kind of ebbs and yeah. flows to the thing. So sorry for taking that turn. It's one of those, you know, I think it's just part of it, I guess. <laughs> People but, will understand why it's funny in the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> We're not <laughs> definitely not laughing about Gita passing away for sure. No. It's still very sad. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. also that, that Hana experience that we'll share next time was that also defined the struggle of, not the struggle, the evolution of friendship. I think it is why she is who she is now. Mm-hmm. So even though it wasn't necessarily you know, f- for perfect her, at the moment. For her and for Maya and Gita, you know, sure. they weren't quite ready for the third wheel. <laughs> no. To say the least. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, then uh, I'll let you go. It's been a pleasure talking to you as always. And then we'll catch up in two weeks' time for our next recording. And then we'll talk about more about um, Maya and also Hannah, introducing Hannah as the third elephant to come to your sanctuary. So, yes, take care and uh, have a great rest of your week. Thank you, you again, too. Nadia. It's a pleasure. Bye. Bye. Take care. Okay, that's all for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you haven't yet subscribed, then do subscribe to our podcast to make sure you never miss another episode and catch up in two weeks' time. And until then, take care. Bye. (laughs) 